Thank you, Stetson, and uh, good to be with you guys. You know, it's weird. I, I, did, I did do my undergrad here at Biola, and yet I don't think about that very much when I'm on campus. Uh, I came in 1988, and I'm, I was realizing this morning uh, that, that that really makes me old, because probably uh, uh, many of you weren't even born in, uh, in 1988. Um, uh, you know, things were a little different in 1988 at Biola. I was, I was trying to think what, 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 what it was like, and, and one, one thought that came to mind is there was a lot more hair in 1988, and particularly the, particularly the girls. It, you know, there's kind of these really kind of frizzed out uh, hairdos were really, were really big in 1988, and there's a lot more fluorescent colors. I, I remember I had these fluorescent green shorts, and they were really cool shorts. I, I wore them a lot. Uh, and, and fluorescent yellow was really big in 1988. And uh, so uh, other than that, it was probably a, a, the same as, as, as you guys, but more hair and uh, fluorescent uh, colors uh, were in. And also I was thinking my shorts probably went down to about here. And that was pretty long, you know, well, well above the knee, but, but that was still pretty long. So, um, you know, the other thought I was having as I was sitting here, just thinking about that I've, I was uh, sitting where you're sitting uh, a while back. Um, I went to so many chapels. You guys go to so many. Um, so many classes. You get so much input. So much input. Um, I, I, I think probably too much input, really. Um, but I'm just trying to think, you know, all that input I received, you know, some of it, a lot of it, I think, really helped me and, and did good in my life. Um, but, but the other thought is I just thought, you know, it, you're gonna be okay. Uh, whatever way your life goes, you're, you're gonna be okay. I, I, I saw the people come in and, and go out the side door uh, as their chapel credit you know, earlier, you know, and, and they're gonna be okay too. You know, you're gonna be okay. I, I think of the people I went to Biola with, and we've all done crazy, stupid stuff, and our lives have gone in directions we never would have imagined, but, but we're doing okay all in our different ways, we're, we're doing okay. Um, and I was thinking of Paul's words to the Philippian church where he says that, you know, he who began a good work in you will bring, bring it to completion. Uh, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion. Um, in that same vein, I was thinking of the, the English mystic Julian of Norwich. And Julian of Norwich has, uh, she claims, this, has had this uh, mystical experience with God. And the message that she receives from God is, it will all be well. It'll all be well. And, and there's a deep truth in that from a Christian perspective, right? It, it, it's gonna be all right. It's gonna be all right. You're gonna be fine. That's not our topic today. Our topic is pride. Um, and I'll have to tell you the truth. Yesterday morning I was uh, looking at my calendar for today and I noticed that I was speaking in chapel on pride. Now, I had remembered I was speaking in chapel on pride last week, uh, but between last week and yesterday morning, I had just gotten caught up with other things that I had to do. And so yesterday morning, my to-do list went from thinking I had other things at the top to all of a sudden, oh, I need to think about what I'm gonna say in chapel tomorrow. And I share that with you not to tell you I'm, un I'm unprepared, because I, I did, uh, I have been thinking about it, and I do, I think, have some things that are meaningful to share with you. But I share that with you because I think that, that gives you a sense of what my semester's been like, and maybe you can relate. Just going from one thing to the next. What's, what's the next thing I gotta do by tomorrow? Okay, that's done. What's the next thing I gotta do? Some of those things might be fun, some of those things might be stressful, but, but oftentimes we're living that life, right? Some people call it uh, the tyranny of the urgent, right? Just, just going from one thing to the next, or sometimes it's problems. Just as one problem comes and you kind of, you know, scramble back up to the surface and take a breath, here comes the next wave, right? And, 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 I, and that's been my semester in, in all of those ways. Tyranny of the urgent, Problem after problem, right? That, that's life oftentimes, right? And then I thought about our topic. I thought pride. Here we are at the end of the semester. We're, we're, we're tired. We're, we're, just, we're just barely hanging on to the end. You're just trying to get the last few you know, chapel credits you need so you, know, you don't get whatever you have to do to, when you don't get them, right? And, and, we're, and, and now we're going to talk about pride, right? Ah, that's, is that, we need an encouraging message, right? And pride oftentimes isn't that. But then I thought, you know, maybe, maybe it's this time of year uh, 
that is really perfect for talking about pride. Because I think we might be able to see our pride more clearly and deal with it more effectively when we're down. When, when maybe life is not going like we want it to go. Uh, whether that's because you have papers and tests due or financial issues or relational issues or stuff going on in your spiritual life or your home life or whatever it is. But, but sometimes our, our pride is, is best noticed and dealt with when we don't feel so hot. Right? And, and we're able to see that our pride is at work and maybe we're scrambling to get back in control. So what is pride? Um, the first thing I thought that it's, it's always helpful to say when we're talking about pride is, is, of course, there is some sort of healthy kind of pride, some sort of appropriate kind of pride, right? My, my seven-year-old son is playing uh, Little League Baseball, and I feel proud of him when he hits the ball. He doesn't always hit it, but I feel proud of him. Whether he hits it or not, I feel proud of him. But I'll tell him, I say, son, I'm, I'm so proud of you, right? Whether he has a good game or a bad game, son, I'm proud of you, right? Or you might feel proud of, of a friend or a family member. Uh, or sometimes we feel proud about being part of a group. Uh, you might be proud of your ethnicity or uh, being part of Biola University or part of a team or part of a, a musical group. You feel a sense of pride that, that there's something good here and you appreciate it about this group. Or we feel pride about ourselves, where we, we hung in there, we persevered, we accomplished something. You might be proud of yourself that you finished the marathon or that you did as well as you did on that test or proud of yourself about how you responded to a certain challenging situation. And all of that seems healthy, appropriate, to, to feel good about some good in our life. Nothing wrong with that. But, but that's where pride can, can, can turn to what we're gonna talk about today as the vice of pride. That's where pride can go vicious. Because when pride goes vicious, what happens is we take some good in our lives or some good we're connected to, some good in someone else's life that, that we feel connected to, and we take that good and instead of just feeling good about it, instead of just feeling excited about it, we, we use that good, we use that good to ground ourselves. We use that, that good to make ourselves feel better and to try to make ourselves feel valuable. We use whatever the good is, we take pride in it in the vicious way when, when we try to find life in it. We try to find some sort of love or acceptance or meaning or value, some sort of groundedness in, in certain goods that we have or that others have that we're connected to. And, and now we're using these goods to, to somehow soothe us, to somehow make ourselves feel up. And what's prideful about it, ultimately, is that we're using something else besides God to do something that God was meant to do in our life. We're finding our identity, our grounding, our life in some sort of good rather than in God. And now that's pride. That's the vice of pride. Because now I'm saying, God, I, I don't really need you. I don't really want you. I'll be okay with this. Sometimes when my son's up there at, at bat, I'm really hoping he just spanks that ball. You know, I'm just, I'm just, I'm, I'm hoping that, that, that he hits that ball farther than any of these other kids, right? Now, when I'm thinking that, that's not just, son, I'm proud of you. That's somehow, if he does that, I look better. Right? That's my son, yeah. He's better than these other kids, right? So now so something different has happened. Now I'm trying to use my son's accomplishment to make me feel bigger, stronger, better, more important, more valuable, give my life some sort of meaning. Now I'm using some good, in this case, the good of my son's baseball performance to fill a place in my heart that was meant to be filled by God. That's the vice of pride. 
That's when we're now taking some good and we're trying to fill ourselves on it. St. Paul talks about this in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. And he talks about it in an interesting way because in this passage, as you guys know this passage, he's talking about the thorn in his flesh, right? But notice, notice how he situates the thorn in his flesh. He says, because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations that have been given to him, for this reason, to keep me from being prideful, right? To keep me from exalting myself, to keep me from taking these, these revelations I've received that he's this amazing apostle, that he's being used by God in this mighty way, to keep him from exalting himself, there was given a thorn in his flesh, a messenger of Satan, to torment me. He says again, to keep me from exalting myself. The surpassing greatness of the revelations that Paul had been given were were revelations from God. This this was that Paul was, was, was the apostle that was bringing the good news to the Gentiles. He 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 was the apostle that was was uh, pastoring the early churches. And yet he could use that great good of how God was using him to exalt himself. Oftentimes ministry and and spiritual growth uh, and Bible knowledge, you know, we can use these things as actually little idols, little gods, little things that we take pride in to fill ourselves. And Paul says, I don't want to exalt myself on that. Well, actually, looks like he does want to exalt himself. To keep him from doing it, he gets this thorn in his flesh. We're going to come back to this notion of a thorn. Uh, So I want to go on with the passage. Concerning this, he says, I implored the Lord three times that it might leave me, right? He couldn't get rid of it himself, and now he's trying to get God to get rid of it. And as you know, as the passage goes on, but God said to him, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is perfected in your weakness. And Paul says, most gladly, therefore, I'll rather boast about my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I'm well content with weaknesses, with insults, with distresses, with persecutions, with difficulties, for Christ's sake. For when I'm weak, then I'm strong. And there's that connection between When life isn't going so well, that may be a great time for us to talk about pride. Because when we're going through distresses and persecutions and difficulties and insults and weaknesses, right, we're reminded that we're really not everything we want to be. That we're really smaller than we'd like to be. That we that we really need God more than perhaps we want to admit sometimes. And so difficulty, stress, failure has a way of opening us more deeply to how much we need God and how we can't make life work on our own. That all our prideful attempts to try to take some goods in our lives, how we look, what we have, who we know, what kind of person we are, how smart we are, Right? We try to take all these goods and somehow ground ourselves in those things. It doesn't work. We weren't made to be grounded in who we know and in how smart we are or how we look or what kind of car we drive or what zip code we live in. We weren't made to be grounded in those things. They're part of us, but as soon as we try to find life from those things that we're meant to find in God, we're, we're involved in idolatry, right? And pride is that part of us that, that as, as, as one writer put it, it's, it's easier to try to be God than to love God. And see, pride is that part of us that, that would rather be God than to love God or to trust God. I'd, I'd rather try to be my own God, right? It's the sin of Adam and Eve, right? Adam and Eve, their sin isn't that they, that they tried to be too small, Their sin wasn't that they didn't live up to their expectations. Their sin was that they tried to be too big. They they tried to exalt themselves. They they tried to be like God. Maybe we can be like him. Maybe we don't really need him to tell us what's right, what's wrong. Maybe we don't really need to listen to his words. Maybe we can trust our own word. Maybe I can figure this out for myself. And at some level, right, we're all brothers and sisters in Christ. We've given up on that. We know that we can't do it ourselves. We know we need Jesus. We know we need forgiveness. And yet, coming to Jesus and even 
walking with Jesus for many, many years, sometimes quite painfully we come to see that we haven't totally given up on that. The, the pride project is still at work. It's what St. Paul calls the flesh. Right? The pride project is still at work. There, there are still these parts of our lives where we are trying to be our own God rather than trust God. And quite frankly, I, I think it, it makes sense that we would. He's hard to trust. He doesn't play by my rules. Life doesn't go the way I want it to go when I'm trusting him. If, if I want life to go on my terms, I better get busy because I don't know if he's gonna do what I want him to do, right? And so it's hard to trust him. It's hard to say with Jesus, not my will, but yours be done. We can say it, but we should also probably follow it up with, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. Lord, I wanna say, not my will, but yours be done. But quite frankly, I want your will to be my will. I want life on my terms. Now, one other piece of pride, and then we're gonna turn to, well, what do we do about it? But one other piece of pride that I think we need to think about, let me see what my next slide is. Uh, yeah, okay, we'll, we'll, st we'll stop there. Um, one other piece of pride, or, or, or issue with pride, is you might think, well, I don't, I don't struggle with pride. I, 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 I think really poorly of myself. I, 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 I struggle with self-condemnation. I, I, I hate myself. I don't feel prideful about how I look, or prideful about who I know, or prideful about where I live. I feel weak and inferior and less than. Uh, and what's interesting about that is that's pride too, at least a certain version of it, where we condemn ourselves, where we might even hate certain things about ourselves. Hidden beneath that self-loathing and self-condemnation and self-hate and I'm so stupid, and why do I always do it like that? I'm such a failure. Hidden beneath that is pride. Because what we're really saying is, I don't wanna be this way. I hate that I'm this way. I really wanna be like this, because if I was like this, then I'd be all right. We're, we're still trying to make life work. We're just realizing that we're failing at it, and then we're angry at ourselves about it because we really want to be something that we're not. Right? Self-condemnation and self-loathing is, is another form of pride. It's still an attempt to fix ourselves, to blame myself for not being better because if I was better, then I would be okay. Right? Do you see how that's still prideful? It's still my attempt to try to trust in my own resources to fix myself, to feel good about myself, to find value, to find meaning, and I'm, I'm failing at it. I, I don't like the way I look, or I don't like the way I dress, or I, don't, uh, I think I'm, I'm, I didn't do well in my class. I'm failing, and I get down on myself, and, but really what I'm getting down on is I'm failing to live up to this ideal I have that if I achieved it, then, then I'd be okay. Then I'd have life on my terms, right? So low self-esteem is, uh, as one psychologist put it, a low self-esteem problem is also a pride problem. Because if we're berating ourselves about something, what's underneath that is an expectation that we should be better. And that expectation that we should be better is, again, part of this attempt to try to be God rather than love God. Now, I want to talk a little bit about pride as resistance to God's love, and then I want to give us something practical to do, with, to do about the pride problem and how we can engage God in this. Someone has said that pride is a gross underestimation of our need for God. Pride is a gross underestimation of our need for God. When we're living in some element of pride, we think that we can somehow make our lives work without him. And as I said, we would rather be God than to trust God. Psalm 10 has an interesting way of putting this point. 
Uh, in his pride, the wicked does not seek him, God. In all his thoughts, there is no room for God. See, uh, we, we know the psalm, uh, or excuse me, the proverb that says God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. And that's what's going on here. The, in his pride, the wicked does not seek him. All this, in all his thoughts, there's no room for God. When we're prideful, there's no room for God. God opposes the proud because if you're proud of yourself and your accomplishments and you're, and you're getting life from them, there's nothing that he can do but oppose you or me because there's no room for him. There's no room. Have you ever been with someone who's got a huge ego? They just think they're great? There's no room in that person's life for anyone else. There's no room for affirmation from someone else if you're constantly affirming yourself. And there's no room for God if I think I'm all that. There's just no room for him. So God opposes the proud because the proud, they don't need him. He can't do anything else but stand back. He gives grace to the humble because at least the humble realize they're in need, that they're in need. And so pride is a form of resistance. And pride is the deadliest sin. Let me show you this uh, picture really quick. Um, this is a, uh, a, a picture of a, um, what's called the tree of vices. Maybe you've seen this. Uh, but this is a, a medieval uh, painting, drawing, of, of the vices. And the medieval theologians thought about all of the seven deadly sins as, as a tree. And this is in Latin, so if you're trying to read it, it's written in Latin, and it's also written in kind of an old script. But... Um, but here is a, and this is still hard to read, but here's an English uh, uh, t- transliteration. If you can see it, down at the, the, the root of the tree of vices is pride. This is why I titled the talk today, The Deadliest Sin, because pride is the root of all the other vices, of all the other deadly sins. It's at the bottom. Why? Because as we resist God and pridefully try to find life apart from him, it doesn't work, and so we need to sin in other ways to cover it up, to deal with it, to cope with it. As I try to find life through my son's baseball performance, that's not going to work for me. That's not going to soothe me, and so now I'm going to get angry at him when he doesn't perform like I want him to. I'm going to shame him. And and then I'm gonna have to try to find life someplace else, so I'm gonna go out of here or over here. And so all the other sins flow out of pride because pride is what keeps us from the source of nourishment that we were made for, namely God's love, his grace, his acceptance, the value that we have in him, that he loves us, that he knows us, that he cares for us, right? So how do we connect more deeply with that? C.S. Lewis put it this way. This is a long quote, but I think it's worth it. For it's not so much of our time and so much of our attention that God demands. It's not even all of our time and all of our attention. It's ourselves. For he has in the last resort nothing to give us but himself. And he can give us that. Uh, I just lost track. And he can give that only insofar as our self-affirming will retires and makes room for him in our souls. Let us make up our minds to it. There'll be nothing of our own left over to live on, no ordinary life. What cannot be admired, what must only exist as an undefeated but daily resisted enemy is the idea of something that is our own, some area in which we are to be out of school, on which God has no claim. For he claims all because he he is love and must bless. He cannot bless us unless he has us. When we try to keep within us an area that is our own, we try to keep an area of death. Therefore, in love, he claims all. There's no bargaining with him. See, that's, that's pride. When we try to keep an area of our own, we try to say, God, I'll take care of this part. You can, you can have these other parts, but I'll take care of this. Or, I, I, I'm in charge here, God. It's the deadliest sin because when we try to keep an area of our own apart from him, we're keeping an area locked in deadness. It's not, it's not alive in the resurrection life of God's love by his spirit. It's dead. And now that we have parts of ourselves that, that are still locked in deadness, we have to figure out what to do with them. And so all, all of our sin problems, 
all of our sin problems come from the root of a prideful resistance to God. So what do we do about it? Well, lots of things. But um, I wanna talk and end our time with what I'm calling the discipline of staying down. Remember, uh, when I was about 16 or 17, I was riding my older brother's 10-speed bike. And um, I was a little bit small for his 10-speed bike. I might have even been younger. I was probably more like 10 or 11. I was a little bit small for his 10-speed bike, and I can remember quite clearly that I was riding his 10-speed bike uh, down the street, and I was kind of on the sidewalk, and I was gonna hop the curb like I would do on my little BMX bike. But when I tried to hop the curb on my brother's 10-speed bike, uh, I I didn't hop the curb, I hit the curb. And I flew forward and um, hit the the handlebars with a part of my body that uh, causes a lot of pain. And I don't care if you're a a male or a female, that can cause a lot of pain. Maybe males have a particular uh, sensitivity. I'm not sure. But um, I collapsed on the ground and, and immediately thought to myself, that really hurt. And then immediately thought to myself, did anyone see me? And, and, and in, in great hope that no one had seen me, I got up really quickly and, and put my bike up and looked around and thought, oh good, no one saw me, ow, that really hurts, oh good. No. And, and, and I, I didn't want my ego to be crushed. Something else had been crushed, I didn't want my ego to be crushed. <laughs> and, and, and so I was trying to, to, to get up quick, right? Because I, I didn't want to stay down. And and sometimes in life, we need to stay down. We're very habituated to fall, to fail, to to experience some weakness, some problem, some difficulty, and to try to overcome it, to try to fix it, to try to cover it up, to try to avoid it. And sometimes we just need to stay down. When we fall, we need to, and I think this, when you fall, here's the discipline of staying down. When you fall, don't get up too quickly. I mean, literally, you could even practice it when you physically fall. Don't get up, just, you might just wanna sit there for a moment and think, I'm so weak. I'm so finite. I'm so vulnerable. God, I need you so much. When you fall in a relationship, don't, don't try to get up too quickly. Just, gosh, I'm, I'm so frail. I make mistakes. I screw up. We can stay there. Why? Because we don't have to wallow in it. We can stay there because when we're weak, we're more open to God's strength. To keep me from exalting myself, Paul says, there was given me a thorn in my flesh, some problem that we don't know what it was that kept Paul down. And when Paul stayed down, there was more room in his life for God to move. When he was weak, He was actually stronger. So the discipline of staying down is when something hard comes along, don't try to get up, don't try to cover it, don't try to avoid it, don't move to self-condemnation, oh, I'm so bad and I screwed up again. Just just say, Lord, I'm so small, I'm so weak, I need you so much. When you fall, don't don't move to condemnation. Try, Try not to move there. If you catch yourself going there, just say, Lord, why am I doing that? I need you. When you fall, embrace your weakness and open to the reality of God's love, acceptance, deep knowledge, and care. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.